with his wife and two kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, do, do this again. Do it again. Yeah. So he lives in London with his wife and, and two cats. And two cats. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wong. Hello. Good evening. Good afternoon. Where's my picture? Hello. Yes, my name is Ken Wilson. The motivate and in the program it says 10 ways to get your students to do something but the 10 ways is an hour-long talk so I've had to shorten it so it's now seven ways to get your students to do something I'll come back next year and tell you the other three okay <laughs> I really want to thank Absi for inviting me here and particularly Evandro Pessoa who I have known for 32 years since we were both 10 years old. It was such a... <laughs> when I first came to, not here to Fortaleza, but to Maceo. Evandro, was it Maceo we met? In Maceo, when we did some shows with my theatre. Evandro and I are very close friends. He stayed in my house many times. One time, he got ill. I had to dial 999 and bring the ambulance to take him to hospital because he had a very bad kidney stone. He was in terrible pain. And there's a, an expression you should know if you get ill in England and you're lying in bed under a duvet and going oh, 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 which is what he was doing the paramedic will say are you decent are you decent which means are you wearing any clothes underneath that duvet because I'm gonna take the duvet off in a moment and of course he's a very decent man <laughs> so he said yes and they took unfortunately he was wearing some boxer shorts under the duvet and then the interesting thing was, then the man said, where does it hurt? And Evandro said, it hurts here, it's really pain. I'm sorry, Evandro, I wasn't going to tell this story. But. And then the man said, is there any referred pain? Do you know this expression? Which means pain somewhere else in your body? And Evandro went, what is the third pain? Which is interesting, because it stopped hurting when he said that. So if you have a friend who is in pain, just confuse them. Confuse them and the pain will stop. Okay, now here we are at this conference and you're listening to lots of ideas, ideas. Every workshop you go to, there's a great idea and you think, not sure, not sure, not sure about that, okay? Not in my class. You must try the ideas you have seen. You must go back to your class and try at least one of the ideas three times. Give it three goes before you try because it's important to feel a sense of success. So I'm going to help you feel intrinsically successful. Can you all please stand up for a moment? This is a long time. I'm going to, no, it's not. But first, first of two times, I'm going to ask stand up. Everybody stand up. Don't complain. You ask your students to stand up sometimes. Everybody up? Good. Now, we are going to feel a sense of success by going to this place. What happens at this place? Now, I'm really hard of hearing, so you have to shout your answers really loud. What happens at this place? Okay, it's one of the Grand Slam tournaments. I want you to imagine you are in the competition where there's one person on this side and one person on this side. What kind of tennis is that? Singles. Singles. Well done. Okay, now don't all look at me like that. Just shout the answer. And don't worry if you got the wrong answer. Okay? If you write doubles, and I'll say it's a great answer. It's wrong, but it's a good I'm glad you shouted. <laughs> Singles. Okay? And what's the last match of the tournament called? All right, so the final of the singles is called the singles final, funnily enough, you know. Okay, imagine you are in the singles finals, okay, and it's the last point of the game, the, the point that you can win the tournament. What's that point called? It, well done, you're doing much better now. Just shout stuff out, it doesn't matter if it's wrong. Shout it in Portuguese if you want to, okay. Now, does anybody know who was the last Brazilian to win a singles title at Wimbledon? Anybody know? Here she is, your great hero. What's her name? Bueno. Maria Bueno. Does anybody remember? No, because it's before you were born. When she won the singles title at Wimbledon? Have a guess. Just shout any answer. 1952. Thank you for shouting the answer. And you're Brazilian, right? That's great. 
Yeah. No, you know, where are you from? I'm English. Oh, bollocks. You see, this is the problem. The, the English do this. They shout stuff out all the time, you know, and, and they don't care. The English don't care if they're wrong. They really don't care. There's a funny thing about the British. They're a very strange, well, the English are a very strange race indeed. They like, go, they like going to football matches and then having a fight. It's a very strange combination. But thank you very much for shouting out. 1952 is a bit early. Anyone try anything else? 58. 58, a great answer. Was that you, Roddy? No, it wasn't. Who was it? Steve. Well, you're kind of Br Brazilian. All right. Okay. It was a bit later than 58. The first one was, it, it was actually 59, 60. I could be here all day with this, couldn't I? Unfortunately, you, remember, you're in the final of the singles. Your opponent is a bit stronger. If you're a woman, this is your opponent. Possibly the finest tennis player in the history of women's tennis, okay? If you're a man, this rather wonderful young man from Scotland, what are their names, please? And, okay. Andy Murray. Andy Murray. So I'm gonna to have to put my microphone down for this part. I want you to get the ball in your hand. Get the ball in your hand, everybody. Come on, let me see the ball. And bounce it, bounce it, okay? No, it's not volleyball, come on. <laughs> Yeah, look, it's like that. The ball's this big. It's this big. Bounce, catch. Bounce and catch. Don't, don't, you can't catch it like this. It doesn't work. Now get your tennis racket. This might, may mean changing hands with the ball. I know, right. Bounce the ball. Are you ready? Okay. I'm gonna, after three, we're going we're gonna to serve for the match. Are you ready? Bounce, bounce. Up and serve. <sighs> right. Now we know why there'd be no Brazilian winners since 1964. No, that, Look, you cannot win Wimbledon if you don't make a very loud noise when you serve. <laughs> this noise is called a grunt. A grunt. Can we please practice our Sorry, One, two, three. That's not bad. Bit louder, come on. Get the ball, get the ball. Bounce it, bounce it. After three, serve and grunt. Here we go. What? That's great. Unfortunately, that hit the net. That hit the net. You have a second serve. You can do it. You can do it. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Up and serve. And yes, congratulations. You are the Wimbledon champion. <clears throat> Take a seat. So that's about feeling a sense of success. I want you to feel a sense of success when you go back to your classes and you try out some of the things you've seen at this, com at this um, uh, conference. Now, <clears throat> what I'm talking about today is motivation, not this intrinsic motivation to learn English. It's the motivation that your students have to come to your class and why they like coming back to your class. Remember, most of your students like you very much. So probably the things I'm going to talk about, you already do and they already feel about you. But to help me with my research, Here's a very interesting man. His name is Jolton Dernier. What kind of a name is that? Where's he from? Hmm? Hungarian. He's Hungarian. He lives in the UK. He works at the University of Nottingham. This is his most famous motivational book, Motivational Strategies in the Language Classroom, published by Cambridge University Press. I'm an Oxford University Press author, but I'm not allowed to talk about it because Oxford have been banned from this uh, conference for some reason. Very good books. And Jolton, in this book and in other places, has done lots of research to find out why students like to come to class. Okay, everybody quiet over there? Good. And he came up with five motivational factors. The reasons why your students like coming to class, not particularly why they want to learn English. You see the difference? Why do your students enjoy coming to your class? They're pretty obvious. The teacher has a good relationship with us. If you teach teenagers, they don't want to be your friend, but they want to think that when you walk in, you look as if you're happy to be in the classroom with them. So a smile helps, okay? Uh, she encourages us to think for ourselves. She says, what do you think? What do you think? Lots of times, even with quite low-level students, she enjoys our progress and success. Do you, do you still have paper homework? Paper homework? You give, right, good, that's excellent news. I think um, electronic homework is a bit crazy. But you know, when you give the homework back, you can say, well, that's better than last time. That's not very motivating. This is great, it's better than last time. Just the tone of your voice, that's the kind of thing they like. She creates a safe and supportive environment. Not too safe and supportive, they'll go to sleep. 
But you know, the idea is they feel safe in the classroom. And that's often about the lighting. Don't have neon light in the classroom. But what is the number one motivational factor? Can you imagine what it is? It is this. The teacher is enthusiastic. The most important thing in your student's mind is that you are an enthusiastic teacher. And here's some more research. Okay? This woman you probably don't know. I know her very well. She's my wife. Right? <laughs> and she did an MA in Applied Linguistics and ELT. And she did some research about with students who have a native speaker teacher and a non-native speaker teacher. Not in the same room at the same time, but during the same course. And I found this wonderful quotation from a Romanian student who said, I'd rather have an enthusiastic teacher who isn't a native speaker, even if her English isn't perfect, than a native speaker who isn't very enthusiastic. If you're Brazilian, look at that and smile. It means that your enthusiasm is more important to your students than your, than your native speaker colleague's ability as a native speaker. If you're a native speaker and you're enthusiastic, you're okay. An enthusiastic native speaker is okay. An enthusiastic non-native speaker is actually more fun for the students than uh, <clears throat> an unenthusiastic native speaker. Isn't that fantastic news? Yeah. The only problem is that it means that we have to wake up in the morning going, Yay, I'm an English teacher. Aren't I lucky? You know? Isn't it so exciting? I'm going to get up today and be enthusiastic from my first class at 7 o'clock in the morning to my last class at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, <clears throat> not like that, is it? It's more like this. <clears throat> Do you know this painting? Yes. yes. What's the name of the painting? Scream. I scream. I scream? <laughs> the scream. Who is the, the, the painter? Hmm? Edvard Munch. Edvard Munch. Well done. Where's he from? <laughs> I did this talk in, or a similar talk, I used this picture in Korea, in South Korea, and I said, he's, he lived, comes from a country beginning with N, and the teacher said, Nigeria, I thought, no, from Norway, from Norway, I prefer this version of it, okay, I think that's how most teachers feel in the morning, isn't it, okay, so but how, therefore, can we combine some enthusiasm with ways in which we can encourage the students to match our enthusiasm for our classes. Well, that's what I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at, oh no, I'm not going to look at 10, am I? I'm going to look at seven motivational strategies that might just work. So for the next few minutes, I'd like you to be my class. You're a big class, but I can do big classes and you'll be good students for me as well. So the first strategy I think is really, really important to keep interested in class is to make them curious okay in a moment I'm going to show you a photograph now when a teacher holds up a picture in front of class the class knows what comes next what's he doing says the teacher and the students go you can see for yourself look it's there you know you don't have to ask it isn't the most the dumbest question in the world what is he doing to hold a picture you know and to answer it yourself about it if you can answer the question yourself don't ask it Think of a better question. You know, what's he going to do? That's better. What's he just done? But in this case, I want you to forget all those dumb comprehension questions and just do one thing. What is your first initial reaction to this picture? And whatever you say is right. Whatever your first reaction is, is the correct reaction because it's you. It's how you feel about the picture. Look at the picture. Recognize your initial reaction and then tell your neighbor what your initial reaction is. Here's the picture. <laughs> Come on, tell your name. I want to hear some conversation going on. Talk, talk, talk. This, you're all falling asleep at the back here. This is worrying already. <laughs> That's better, we're waking up now. <clears throat> okay, what was your first reaction? Silly. Silly, I like that, that's good. What's your first reaction? Hello, welcome. What's your first reaction? That's a facial reaction, she's going, I, I need a word to go with that. 
It's difficult to say. Difficult to say. Okay, I'll come back. I'll come back in two minutes. What's your first reaction? He's really hungry. <laughs> He's really hungry. I like that. What's yours? It's painful. Painful. That's very thoughtful. That's very caring. That shows why you're a teacher. Teachers often say that. It looks very painful. Um, would you like to find out something about this guy? We can do something else if you like. Okay. You know, or you can go to sleep. Whatever you prefer. I'll show you some information. His name is Michel Lotito. He was born in 1950 in Grenoble. Anybody know where Grenoble is? It's in France. Well done. He's known as Monsieur Monstu. Anybody speak enough French? Know what he means? It's everything, okay? He, he eats metal and glass. What? He can eat a bicycle in what? He can eat a bicycle in six days. Whoop! Would you like to find out more about this guy? Are all your students this quiet? Yeah. Come on, I did this, uh, I did this talk in Mexico two, a month ago and they went, yeah, really loudly. You don't want, you don't want to be badly co compared to Mexicans, do you? Okay, do you want to find more about this guy? Okay, so I'm going to first. I'm going to give you some pre-reading questions to discuss with your partners. What do you think is the easiest part of a bicycle eat? And what's the most difficult? Talk to Talk, talk, talk to each other. Decide. Oh, and here are the words. Here are the words. Handlebars, frame, seat, wheel, tire, spokes, pedals, chain. Great class now. What's, what do you think the easiest? The Easy. Seat. The seats. I agree. Yeah. Cook it with some mushrooms or something. Anyway. Easiest. What do you think? Time. The tires. Okay. What do you think the easiest? It's the same. The, the seat same. Seat and, seat and tires. What about the most difficult? Um, um, I don't know. Tires. The tires. Yeah. You think the tires yeah. are the most difficult? Because she thinks the tires are the easiest. Okay. Oh, really? Most difficult. The panels. Yeah, they're kind of big and chunky, aren't they? Right. Most difficult. The frame. The frame. Would you like to find out what he thinks? No? We can do something else. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's read about him. I'll read it because it's a bit small. Michel Lotito has been eating metal and glass since 1959. When was he born? So he's been doing this since he was nine years old. What were his parents thinking? Doctors have x-rayed his stomach but remain mystified. Does that mean they understand what's going on or not? Mystified. Is that a, that's a, should be a, um, a cognate. His diet has included, wait for this, 10 bicycles, a supermarket trolley, 7 TV sets, and a Cessna light airplane, which he ate in Caracas and Venezuela. That is one crazy city, isn't it? Right. So. He can eat a bicycle in six days. I start with the frame. He explains, I saw off a piece in a ring as wide as my finger. I eat the handlebars in the same way. Then I cut up the chain and the spokes. The most hardest part is the tires. Wow, hardest part is the tires. Eating a tire isn't as easy as eating the parts. It's like eating a kilo of feathers. Do we know the word feathers? Let's bring feathers into the picture. Okay. Now. Apart from everything else, what I've done here is I have given you the information piece by piece using this very simple classroom technology. And I really recommend you teach, uh, especially if you teach teenagers or younger, to start your presentation, especially of reading material, using a screen if you have this technology. And look what you can do. You see, here's a reading text from uh, a book, and it says, before you read, Look at the picture, what do you think the story is about? You often see that as a pre-reading activity. So what do the students do? They look at the picture and then they speed read the text, which is a clever skill. But you know, it'd be nice if they use their imagination a bit more. So here's the picture, okay? You're my elementary class, not much English. Talk to each other. What is this going to be about, do you think? Talk to each other. Come on, more talking, more talking. <laughs> Now, 
now you're a wonderful class now, but I'm stopping you on the time. What do you think it's about? What's it about? I think the person was kidnapped and the police investigating physical accident. This is my elementary class. You think you <laughs> No, that's good, but that's a lot of good language, you know. Kidnapping, it's a kidnapping. Wow. That could be that. Anything else? Just a simple answer? No, I think that it was just a car crash. Is it a serious car crash? Really serious? So? No. The window isn't broken. It, it's no, not maybe. No, not okay, I'm going to now let you read the first five lines of the story. When a six-year-old boy from Virginia, USA missed the school bus, he wasn't happy. He always had breakfast at school and he didn't want to miss it. He had an unusual and reckless, dangerous pro solution to his problem. He Talk to your neighbor. What was his solution to his problem? <laughs> what was his solution? He got into the car and drove to the school by himself. He's six years old. He got into the car. You think he got in the car and drove himself. You're absolutely right. Well done. And would you like to read the story to my teen class? Want to read the rest? Yeah. Open your book. <laughs> Where's the world? You know, they get this kind of thing about screens. It's in the book. What's the book? Oh, this thing here, right. And they open the book. You see how that works? Start with the screen and then continue with the book. Good idea. Okay, we'll move. Oh, that's my book, Smart Choice, but it's an Oxford University book, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. It's Oxford, stop it, bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> and also it's American English, so you can't use it a cultura inglesa. But it's a fantastic book, even though I say so myself. Right. Second one. Challenge them. This is the last time I'm going to ask you. Can you all please stand up just one more time? Okay, stand up. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up, unless you have a wooden... Come on, everybody up. Come on, boys and girls. And now, can you get into teams of five? Teams of five. This is not the same as yesterday's activity, I promise. Teams of five. There's more, it's okay. That's, it's okay. No, it's okay. You can stay with them. It's okay. okay. Give yourself numbers. One, two, three, five. Give yourself number. One, two, three, four, five. Put your hand up, number one. Put your hand up, number one. Put your hand up, number two. Put that number five. <laughs> right. Listen carefully to the instructions. First of all, tell me who is this man? Abraham, not Abraham. A. Abraham Lincoln. And who is this man? And what can you tell me about these two men? They were both assassinated. They were both assassinated. Very good, says the teacher. That's not very good. Assassination is not very good. <laughs> Have you noticed you do that? Yeah, 1,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Excellent. You know, that's a ridiculous thing to say to 1,000 people were killed in the earthquake. It's a terrible thing, even if the sentence is correct. When I worked in Spain, in the south of Spain, um, my students would never use the past tense unless I hit them with a stick. I had to hit them with a stick to make them use the past tense. On a Monday morning, I said to Juan, Juan, where were you on Friday? He said, I go to my grandmother's funeral. I said, go? He said, mm. I went to my grandmother's funeral. I said, very good. <laughs> oh, your grandmother died. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Stupid. You know, you put in language first. They're real people with real lives. Be careful. Be careful when you say very good in a situation like that. Okay, now this is what's going to happen. I'm going to show you, as you may know, there are some very unusual similarities about the lives and deaths of these two men. I'm going to show you ten facts. First five and then another five, six to ten. So number one, you just read number one and number six on the second slide. Does that make sense? If you're number one, you read number one and number six. Number two and Seven. number four and not eight. That's mathematics. Four and nine. Five and ten, three and eight. Are you ready? The thing is, I'm only going to give you seven seconds to read it. Okay? So try and remember as much as you can. Here's the first 
five, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. It's gone. Complain, make a noise. Teacher, that's terrible. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you were too slow. Here's the next six. Come on. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay? Complain more. More time. Do you want more time? <laughs> five seconds. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. And here we go. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Tell the people in your group what you've learned. Tell the people in your group what you learned. time so here is all the information read it read the info oh what's happened what happened what happened to that what happened oh there it is Thank you very much. Sit down. You've been a fantastic, you are a fantastic class. Let's have a moment of silence. In Brazil, impossible. You're a wonderful class. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to stop you doing these things. That was really interesting. What was fascinating then was that you were all reading that and you were talking and nobody was listening to anybody. But it's fascinating. Oh my God, look at that. Blah, 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 blah. That's just the way Brazilians are. It's good. Every Latin country is the same. I do this in Japan. <laughs> which is fine. It's their way of doing things. People do things differently. And it's, but it's so fascinating. Shush. Oi. Israel. Quiet. Dear boy. The difficult student in the class is Israel, who I've also known since 1984. So I could that. Um, <clears throat> no, it's interesting. So you all stand there talking at the screen and not listening. It's really fascinating. I don't know why it happens, but I'm really interested to see it happen. But what I like best about it is the fact that you're interested and curious to find out why did I do that? Why did I make it so difficult? Because it's Friday afternoon and frankly, you look a bit tired. But you're not really tired. You just, I've had enough of sitting down and reading and stuff, you know? I need to do something different. And standing up, getting off seat is a key part of that. Now don't worry, the rest of the talk is more of a talk. So no running around, no standing up. I, I, I think that's true. Right. Number three. Teach. Unplug. I'm looking for ways to make your students feel more engaged in the class. So you know this friend, teaching unplugged. Some of you may think you know it. Some of you are not sure. Just talk about it a bit more. Teaching Unplugged starts with this man. Who can tell me the name of this man? Scott Thornbury. Very good. In about 2001, Scott wrote an article saying, we are not serving the best interests of our students by giving them a course book. The course book is becoming a barrier between the teacher and what the students really need. I write course books. I don't know why I'm telling you this stuff, okay? But he said as an example, he was sitting in a classroom in Mexico City with a bunch of adults on a Monday morning and the teacher walked in and said, good morning class. And the class said, good morning, good morning teacher. 
<laughs> you really are a quiet group, really are. For Brazilians, you're really quiet. And Mexicans are very noisy, so try and pretend to be Mexican for two seconds. Good morning, class. Good morning, Good morning class. How are you? Fine. Did you have a nice weekend? Yes. And then she said to this student at the front, Jorge, did you have a nice weekend? And Jorge said, Yes, I had a very nice weekend. She said, Really? What did you do? He said, I got married. She said, Really? Open your books at page 26. <laughs> now, if you laughed, then that's good. If you didn't laugh, think about why you didn't laugh. That was a big lost opportunity. Just to follow that train for a moment and just take some time to let Jorge talk about his wedding. To ask about the wedding. Why is he in class on a Monday morning if he got married on Saturday? Things like that. And you can't always rely on that kind of thing but you see Scott said you, know, you can go in you can go in with a bus ticket in your hand and have a class for 45 minutes well Scott Thornbury can do that go to a classroom with a bus ticket and make the bus ticket last 45 minutes most of us can't do it so he needed somebody to come along and calm down his ideas and this man came along who is this man? Luke Meddings Luke Meddings okay and together they calmed Scott's original ideas down about Teaching Unplugged and they wrote this book. Teaching Unplugged, very clever idea. It's a book about not using books. <laughs> Quite a clever trick, if you can do it. Okay, and the movement which they kind of nominally head is called Dogma ELT. Dogma ELT. You may have heard this expression, you may not, but let's just look at the history. Where did they get this word from? What is dogma? Can anybody tell me who this man is? He's not a teacher. Very good, you're my film expert now, as well as everything else, okay? His name is Lars von Trier, and somebody in your class might know that. And he belongs to this movement of 1990s Scandinavian filmmakers who decided that Hollywood was a disaster, big movies with sound effects, explosions, car crashes, were bad ideas, real movies in real time, with a handheld camera, an improvised script, in fact, the most famous film he directed was called Melancholia, which actually cost $10 million to make, but, so it wasn't quite as simple as you suggest. But that's dogma film business. What is dogma ELT? Well, there are three basic principles behind the teaching unplugged idea, and they are these. That it's materials light. You don't walk in and say, good morning class, open your books. You start without materials. You start with a conversation, not just what did you do. You, imagine, you invent some conversations that you think will help the students in front of you improve their language. And this is the most important part. You deal with emergent language. When you give the students the, the chance to say something that's valuable and relevant to their lives, you will see what they can't quite say and you will extend their language in that way. That's the idea behind teaching unplugged, teaching without books. People still want to teach with books, okay? Otherwise, I would be out of a job. But two years ago, I became a language student and I had to learn this language. I went to school to improve. What is this, please? German. Ja, just ein bisschen Deutsch lernen, weil ich müsste ein Reder und ein Hochzeit machen. You all understand what I'm saying? Yeah? That's good. Can I get it in Deutsch? Shall I tell you sorry, in English? What? Okay? Because I had to go to this city, try and guess where it is. What country could it be in? Germany. Germany. Excellent. You see, getting the idea now. Just throw a name out. It is in Germany. It's Bamberg in Germany. For the wedding of these two lovely people, this young man is my Spanish nephew, Enrique. And the woman is now his wife, Regina, who is German, although she was born in Kazakhstan. And three years ago, she's a lovely woman, Regina. Three years ago, when we were all in Canada, Regina came to me and said in her beautiful English, German accented English, Ken, I want to ask you to do a favor. <laughs> and I said, Regina, I will do anything for you that is legal for the uncle of your future husband to do. <laughs> she said, I want you to make a speech at the wedding. I said, sure. She said, can you do it in English and in Spanish and in German? <laughs> I said, Regina, I speak next to good Deutsch. I don't speak good German. Now, if I say to you, I don't speak good Portuguese, and you want to contradict me, you say, oh yes you do, or oh, yes you can, da 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 da. That's contradiction intonation. But the problem is that every answer is different. 
you know, I don't have uh, enough money. Oh, yes, you do. I'm not very good at this. Oh, yes, you are. Every answer is different. In German, there's just one answer. Do you know what the answer is? Doch. Doch. If I say something and you disagree with me in German, you say doch. So I said, Regina, ich spricht nicht so gut Deutsch. And she said, <laughs> You really are a bit quiet this afternoon, aren't you? I'm used to a bit more noise. Uh, give me a really big doch, okay? I'll start again. I'll, I'll give you a time, okay? Regina, ich spreche nicht so gut Deutsch. Du sprichst sehr gut Deutsch. You speak, you speak very good Do Deutsch, German. Well, she, she thought I did, but I don't. So I went back to school. I went to night school. It's very useful as a teacher to go and learn another language, I can tell you. And I got this book called Willkommen, Welcome. On the front it said, Ich liebe dich, I love you. Perfect, it's going to be perfect. And I have to say before anything else, my teacher was wonderful. Lovely German woman, good attitude, hardworking, well prepared, very good with the students. Unfortunately, at the beginning, she told us her course design. She said, and she told us this in English, we're going to talk past holidays, which is another way of saying we're going to practice the past tense, right? And we're going to chat about health issues and illness. I looked around the class. I was almost the youngest student in the class. <laughs> I thought I can't wait to talk about health issues and illness with that 85-year-old woman over there. Du hast was? Entschuldigen Sie, ich weiß nicht, was sagt man auf Deutsch Hemorrhoids. I mean, I just imagine, <laughs> I could just imagine it's going to happen. Uh, the next one, describe weather features. I get so peed off with books that have a unit about the weather and it's about the, w the future with will. English books, okay? You open an English book uh, and if you find one in the exhibition, throw it out the window. It should not be allowed. A unit on weather that says that, that everything's well. So people are saying, what will the weather be like tomorrow? Oh, it will rain. <laughs> Who are these robots? <laughs> nobody in the English-speaking world, well, nobody in England would ever dream of saying that. In London you say, what will the weather be like tomorrow? I haven't a clue. I have not a single idea. It might rain. If you're in California, where it's sunny all the time, and somebody says, what's the weather be like tomorrow? They're saying, are you stupid? Yeah, look, <laughs> it'll be like this again. It's always like this, you know? So it's a stupid unit. And, we, and every book has this weather unit with will. It's ridiculous. It should not be allowed. That's pretty useful. Write a CV and pretty interesting stuff. The point was, this was the contents of the last quarter of this book I'd spent 28 pounds on. They'd already done the first three quarters. So I, was, I felt annoyed about that anyway. We never, never deviated from the book. I tried to make her deviate. Sometimes she said, Ken, das Buch. <laughs> Every time I was, Ken Wilson, a teacher trainer who's te trained teachers in 40 countries, was the worst student in the class. And suddenly I realized why dogma ELT, teaching unplugged, is a good idea. You've got to get away from the book. You have to get away from the book. The message is very, very simple. The message of teaching unplugged is abandon your plan sometimes. Jorge got married at the weekend. Okay, that doesn't with 14 year old students but something like that could happen okay follow the trail see what happens occasionally that's why it's important just forget the book sometimes and that will engage your students more the book can be a very passive thing find out find a way to connect with your students in a different way all right moving quickly on right <clears throat> we always tell teachers you must let your students use their imagination and because, you know, we spoon feed stuff, we give students so much, we give them, we spoon feed is the expression, we give them so much information. Okay, and teachers quite rightly said, sorry, students have fantastic imagination in their own language, but they have problems being imaginative, being creative in English. That's fair enough, a perfectly fair comment. Well, just let's find, find a way to make the activity work for lower level students. We're gonna, I'm going to show you a story called Doctors and Nurses, okay? Here's the story. At the hospital near where I live, all the doctors are women and all the nurses are men. Ooh, interesting hospital. When new patients arrive at the hospital, they always call the doctors nurses, which makes the doctors feel quite annoyed. And they also call the nurses doctors, which makes the nurses feel quite pleased. You get the picture? A woman in a hospital must be a nurse, okay? One day at the hospital, a patient, a man, approached the doctor. Excuse me, nurse, said the patient. When can I see the doctor? 
Listen, said the doctor, I'm a doctor, and the man over there that you think is a doctor is actually a student nurse. Oh, sorry, said the patient. The last time I came to this hospital, that doctor, sorry, that nurse, said that you were a nurse. Well, I'm not, said the doctor. I'm a doctor, not a nurse. Once again, sorry about that, said the patient. By the way, what's your name? Nurse, said the doctor. Doctor, nurse. Well, there's the problem. Okay? <laughs> Typical piece of, you know, amusing you find in an elementary ELT book. But let's look at the first paragraph again. It's all narrative and no description. So quite some time ago now, I started saying to students, I'm going to ask you some questions about this text, but the answers are not in the text. The answers are not in the text. The answers are in your mind. It takes students a little while. I did it once in Budapest, Hungary, my second mention of Hungary. Is anybody here Hungarian? Anybody here been to Hungary? It's a fabulous country. It's a wonderful country, Hungary. Very, very bright people. 10 million people. They have had 22 Nobel Prize winners in history. Uh, Hungarians and American Hungarians. Very, very sharp people. Very difficult to teach. And they speak English in a very interesting way. They go, hello, my name is Gabor. How are you? They start very high and finish very low. Also in Hungarian, which means, can I have a white coffee? Um, that's all I know in Hungarian. And, um, and they speak like this all the time. So I was teaching these 16 year olds. I said, right, we've got the piece in front. I'm going to ask some questions and you must answer from your own experience. At the hospital near where I live. Where is the hospital? And this boy said, near where I live. So near where you live? Near where you live. No, it isn't. He says, I don't know. I said, well, I don't know either. And he said, if you don't know, how can I know? <laughs> so come on. It's in the English-speaking world somewhere. So let's try it with you. And you know, they couldn't get the idea to sound. I said, it's just your story. Let's imagine it's in the English-speaking world. Where is the hospital? Where's the hospital? I don't know. <laughs> you have to give me an answer. I don't know is not acceptable. In the city. Yeah, but which city? In the city of Canterbury. Where? London. London. Excellent. It's in London. I love it. OK. Is it an old hospital or a new hospital? An old hospital. It's an old hospital. How old is it? 100 years old. Uh, 100 years old. So when was it built? <laughs> when was it built? 1806. Okay. Okay. How many beds are there in the hospital? 247 and a half. 247 half. They're building the beds. How many teachers? Are teachers, doctors. Doctor. <laughs> and how many nurses? At 21. Wait. <laughs> I bet they have fun at their parties. Right, okay. And then, what, 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 so once they get the idea, it's great, you know. But what was even better, I said, and the patient, okay, let's give him a name. What's the patient's name? John. John. Don't listen to her. Think of your own answer. <laughs> Uh, Josinho. Josinho. <laughs> All right, Josinho, who's in hospital in London, this 200-year-old hospital, and I say, he's how old? He's very old. And this boy in this Hungarian class said, 30. I said, no, no, he's really, really old. 32. <laughs> and you've got to think about it. They're 16 years old, these kids. So 32 is double their age, isn't it? I'd like you now to double your age. Is that old? Yeah. yeah. In my case, it's dead for 50 years. Yeah. So you get the idea. But you see what I'm doing here? Remember, this is, this is a funny story, but this is fun. A piece of text like this, written by an EFL author, or even an authentic text, you can add information that the students provide for themselves. And then they go home and they write the bigger story. I've got to run, away. I've got to run on quickly. OK. Get your phones out, quick. Phones out, quick. Get your phone, please, get your phones out. I want to give you a, a, a technology-based activity. Switch on your phones and get your photographs up. <clears throat> Are your photos ready? I'm going to give you a 10 second challenge, even shorter. Okay, Is your, come on, where's your phone? Roddy, where's your phone? Get your phone out, come on. Do my as good as well as teacher. Now, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you a 10 second challenge. What happened behind there? Okay? I want you to show me, as far as you can, a picture an animal. Find an animal. Find your phone. Come on. No battery. Find an animal on your phone and hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up in the air. I want to. Come on. I want to see. I want to find a photo. 
Who's up? Find an animal. Come on, hold it up. All right, I'm going to hold it up. There's not people there holding it. There's more people on this. This is perfect. Okay. Hold your phones up so I can see animals. Come on, front as well. They're all at the back. They're waiting for you. Then don't hold up anyway. Right. Now hold up again. Last time. Woo! That's the fancy. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Okay. Now I'm, I'm I'm going a bit fast now, but oh, forget that one. I will do that one more time. No, don't worry. But this one, show. Oh, oh shit! Sorry. <laughs> uh, I've got five minutes. I hurry up. I'm going to hurry up. I'm sorry because you're going to give me five minutes. What's happened? Oh, do something unexpected. Morning class today. We're going to do some mathematics. We're going to have math class. Do you like? Your students do. They prefer math to English. No. Now, I'm going to show you a little puzzle. Uh, if you know the answer, stum, 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 stum. Please, fair. Don't shut the answer. And if and when I ask you to do some mental arithmetic, where's my mental arithmetic sign? Okay. Uh, but don't say any answers and don't share your answers with your friends. Okay. Mental arithmetic based on the following. Think of a number between two and nine. Don't say the number, just think of the number between two and nine. Have you won that? Yes. Excellent. Multiply your number by nine. Ooh, that's the hard part. Have you all done that? Okay. Add the two digits of your number together. Add them. Don't multiply. Add the two digits of your number together. Have you done that? Okay. Now, subtract five. Take away five from your total. Okay. Okay, right. Now, this is the difficult part. Think of your number as a letter of the alphabet. If your number is 1, it's A. If it's 2, it's B. If it's 3, it's C, etc. Okay? So your number is now a letter. This is the hardest part. Think of the name, the English name, of a European country which begins with that letter. Think of the name of a European country which begins with that letter. Okay? If you can't think of one, you've done the maths wrong. Okay. Are you ready? Think of a name of an animal that begins with the second letter of the English name of that country. An animal that begins with the second letter of that. And now think of a typical color of that animal. So you should have a color, an animal, and a country. Have you got those things? Yes. Okay. Are you thinking of? Are you thinking of? A great elephant in Denmark. Woo! That's fantastic. Give me a round of applause for that. That's really brilliant. <coughs> I'll take you back to, I'll, I'll let you take a photograph of this quickly before we go on. Right, take a picture of it if you want to take a picture of the uh, idea. It's a great idea, that. Good way to change what's happening in the classroom, a bit of mathematics. Okay, I've got about a minute left. So, I'm going to finish with a story. Okay, there's the Denmark, there's the elephant. Right. So last one, just a bit of my personal history. I come from a city in the north of England. Well, I can find more minutes, thank you. I come from a city in the north of England, which has been represented by an artist in the 1930s by these paintings. British people here might recognize this artist. You know who it is? Lowry. Hmm? It's L.S. Lowry. And the city is the city of Salford. I was born in a very industrial city. In the 1930s, this man painted pictures of my city because he thought that industry was dehumanizing the people who worked in the factories. And he has a lot of paintings like this. The factories are very large in the pictures. The people are small, stick people all the way. But I'm very proud to come from Salford. I like uh, growing up in that city. And I went to a grammar school. I went to a selective grammar school, which a kind of I don't approve of anymore, but I'm very happy I went to grammar school. It's a very difficult problem, this. That's me on the right at Prize Day. And this school, this grammar school, closed in 1975. But we still have an old boys' dinner every year. And some of those boys are very, very old indeed. 
and my two brothers who are older than me are on the committee which organizes the dinner and every year for 30 years they said please come and give a speech at the old boys dinner and I said no they said why not I said because when you stand up to speak at the old boys dinner it's all men and they're all drunk <laughs> I do not like talking to an audience of just men who are all drunk I prefer to talk to an audience of women and men who are all drunk no but women and men who are sober but two years ago I agreed to give a speech at the old boys dinner and I stood up and said I'm a teacher I'm going to talk about teachers I want to talk about the three kinds of teachers the first kind of teacher is the teacher that you remember all your life because they inspired you and I gave the name of a history teacher the whole room burst into applause I want you to think about that some of the people in the room this man was their teacher 50 years ago and yet the mere mention of his name made everybody burst into applause it's one of the reasons we are in teaching we affect people and we can affect people in a very positive way okay and can you imagine in years time your students sitting around saying do you remember Julia? Do you remember Julia? Yes! How what? This does not happen with dentists. Okay? <laughs> it's a good reason to be a teacher. I then said, there are teachers who actually frighten you. In those days they could hit us with a stick, right? But even teachers who can't hit you can frighten you. And I said, there was a music teacher, and I said, I'm not going to say the name. This was my speech. Almost everybody shouted out the name of the man I was talking about. This terrible man had affected their psyche for 50 years as well. The kind of teacher who makes you frightened. This is not you. P those kind of teachers do not come to this kind of conference. And the third kind of teacher is the one you've forgotten. Do you remember Mr. Lewis, the geography teacher? No, I don't. Can't remember him at all. So, I think it's really important. <clears throat> there are simple ways that you can be a memorable teacher. The first one is don't walk into the classroom with a look like that on your face. You wake up in the morning, you know, your bicycle's broken, your dog is sick, you have an argument with your partner, your children, are in, it's not your student's fault. You can't walk in looking like that because they think, What's, what have I done wrong? A smile costs nothing. A smile costs nothing. Start the day with a smile. It's a way that your students will feel encouraged. So it's to, it's to be enthusiastic. And I'd like to leave you with this image. It's an unusual image. See, a young woman and a great big What's that? What's going on? I'll show you a second picture. The, this woman here, her name is Van, and she is an artist, and she works on a book that I'm currently writing for Vietnamese primary schools. She's a very, very nice artist, and she's actually 42 years old. And she and this other woman were at art school together, and for last year, on the 20th anniversary of their leaving art school, they met up. And what they did, they brought with them these big images of their favorite teachers. They sat around in a cafe talking about their favorite teachers with these big images sitting on the table. I think that says something incredible about the power of being a teacher and have how people can really, really be affected by you and enjoy your company. And it works backwards as well as a backwash. If you're nice to your students, they're nice to you. It makes your life easy. It's not the same if you're a dentist. Okay, so I'm pretty much finished now. Let's see if you remember what I did. Those are the things we did. Oops, oh no, it's gone away. I'll try again. <laughs> okay. Those are the things we did. I'll try and find a way. I have a problem on my blog that the um, cloud effect doesn't work anymore, but I'll try and find a way that you can get, have access to these. I'll ask Evandro if there's a way we can do it here. But that's it. I want to say thank you very much. This is my blog. This is my face. If you're not Facebook friends with me, please join up. And that's my email address. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah, you should.